It's actually a perfect sequencing here because uh, I'm going to touch upon a lot of things that uh, Mike has talked about that I think will be good for the audience. Uh, this talk is really going to be less to do with fat, some to do with fillers, but really how to talk to a patient. And I think that's where my dissatisfaction rate has gone down considerably because I'm able to talk to a patient a little bit better. And I think for me, since October 2010, with the introduction for me into my practice of the micro cannula, I'm able to do things really amazingly well with fillers that I can even, maybe not even get, get with fat. And so communication is everything. And so I'm going to talk about three models. This is something I introduced the other day in my PMA talk. And it's going to be the face like a glass of water, like a bed, and like house on sand. And th these are concepts that I've developed just for communication, nothing profound. But without communication, I always believe that an education is told before and excuses told afterwards. And we, we all are into the process of education, and we don't like to give excuses. So let's talk about the first model, which is the face is like a glass of water. Because with this concept, I think you can really have a patient understand what permanence is. Because everyone wants to say, hey, it's permanent. And I would argue that you know sometimes when patients at seven to eight years look great, sometimes when patients at that point don't look that great. And the question is why? And I really think it's the, it has to do with aging. It's just simple aging. The glass of water that you fill to an ideal over time is going to be lost just because you're going to lose volume by the virtue of nature, uh, by the virtue of aging. And so I use the analogy of a hair transplant. I put a transplant a graft, and that graft is going to stay. It's durable, but you're going to lose your native hair around it. And if you don't understand that, I think patients are going to be d disappointed when they come back four to five years later because there's going to be some attrition. There's going to be some changes with those permanent injectables like fat grafting. So I use an 80-20 rule. I talk about that fat grafting is really going to deliver closer than 80%. Now, clearly, sometimes it's 65%. Sometimes it's 95%. There's some level of unpredictability. It's not 100% guarantee and take. And just like when I'm doing hair restoration, I tell my patients, don't expect 100% take. But with hair, unfortunately, there isn't another option other than another transplant. But in the world of fat, as you heard from Mike, I'm really an advocate of the single session method as well, because patients don't have tolerance uh, for the recovery time and the multiple treatments. And I believe there's other modalities that you can do better with. And I'm going to split it up into an age bracket. So I talk about. For people that just need a, a small fill, a minor fill, I really think that fillers can be adequate and, and more than adequate at times. I like fat grafting for someone a little bit older, and this is a very arbitrary number. I've done fat grafts in 30-some-year-olds. I've done fillers in 70-year-olds. So it's, this is just an idea of communication because fat is free. You can take as much fat as you want and build as much as you want. Fillers are expensive. They're off the shelf. So when you have less that's there, you can put more of it in there and put less of it in there and not cost very much. So cost is a big thing. I think that's something that I like to communicate with my patients. Sometimes, you know, as surgeons or as physicians, we're overly scientific with patients, and I think we have to be pragmatic in terms of our communication ability. The other thing we don't think about, maybe, is the fact that there is a large recovery with fat, but there's multiple smaller recoveries with fillers. So sometimes a two to three day recovery with each set of fillers, if you're doing high volume injections times eight, may be worse than one larger one week or 10 day recovery with fat. I don't know. Some patients say, no, I can take a weekend off, it's fine. But that's a dialogue that you can have with a patient that I think is important. Just briefly, again, I have no financial affiliations with any of the companies about which I speak, but I, I prefer these two fillers and I use them in ways for maximal cost benefit ratio and aesthetic benefit. So I really like Artifil around the eyes, PMMA. I know it's something that a lot of people find frightening, but I do five to six tear troughs a day, literally, um, under the eyes. Uh, I've done close to 2,500 syringes in the face over the last three to four years and really getting good results. Juvederm I like in the outer face, anywhere not around the periorbital region, at least not in the inferior tear trough, and I use that to blend out the face. Juvederm has some really good qualities and has some bad qualities. I think the bad qualities, it doesn't stay exactly where you put it, but in a way that's really good because I've been obsessed with outer face fills, and it's, it's a really, really nice bleed into that area. The other thing we don't think about when we're talking about age is not just the cost, but also, in my opinion, uh, there's also fat, as you heard, you've seen some of these issues down the road, five, six, seven years down the road, is if the weight is unstable, 
there's a risk. And just like when I do a hair transplant in a 26-year-old, I don't know his track record over the, his, next li his lifetime. He's going to age and he's going to progress. And I have to predict long-term problems. And so when I'm doing, dealing with fillers, yes, especially if I'm do, using a long-lasting durable fillers, there may be aging consequences that occur over a period of a decade that I've got to brush up and manage. But fat has that added level, which is the fact that it, it truly is a, uh, it truly is a bioactive product that is donor dominant. In other words, behaves like the donor area because this is an area which is recalcitrant to, to loss and is the first place you gain weight. Something that's in my written consent forms and something I, art I articulate verbally to my patients as well. Are there uh, divicide derived stem cells? I don't know. I, I think I really try to talk to my patients that this is sometimes more marketing or at least we're in a, uh, a period of time that we're uncertain about those, those elements. So let's talk about the second, uh, second concept, which is the face like a bed. So this concept to me is a great way to understand why single session fat, in my opinion, works so well and multiple sessions of fat not only are exhausting but they can lead to failure because when you start to divide the face into these levels, again, this is just a model of communication, nothing fancy. This is not hard science with good data. This is just how to deliver excellence to a patient so that they are aware of your limitations as a surgeon and, the, uh, and your limitations as a and the technology that's there. So fat is a great foundation for the face. It changes that blink you heard Mark talk about. When someone sees the person, they look great. But when in the past, when I said fat was a panacea for aging, people will come back to me in a year and go, yeah, but my tear trough still has, you know, I can still see the shadow. And you know, this little bone that you told me you're gonna cover, I still sort of see it, doc. I don't know what you did. You must be really a bad physician. Well, I'm a bad physician because I didn't communicate well. And so the goal is to understand that fat is a wonderful mattress for the face. And then I know usually duvet sit on top of sheets, but for the sake of this uh, metaphor, the duvet is the filler. It's, allow, it's in allowing me now with the era of micro cannulas to finesse the face with absolute precision, something that I couldn't do in the past with fat or I couldn't do with fillers. And now I believe I have that, that modality because of this tool of the micro cannula. And then the sheets really, you know, when people say, can you fill this little you know, tiny filler, this little line that's on the surface of the skin, it's really hard for me to do that with a filler. I typically use neuromodulators, I use lasers, I use skincare products, things of that nature to finish the edge. And if you can divide the face into this, these levels, I think your communication potential with a patient is much better. And I think you're gonna get better results because the patient will perceive it as better because they understand what's going on. A lot of people say, hey, stick some fillers in there, let me see how it is, and then we'll go to fat. I don't like doing that because I think it's like building a house on sand. What that means is that if I'm building a fat grafted result on top of temporary fillers, I never know when that Juvederm, Restylane, Belotero, whatever HA you're putting in there goes away. I sometimes see it at two years, sometimes three years, sometimes six months. There's this evolution of descent. And when someone pays for a more expensive surgical treatment intervention, I think it's harder because when I do fillers, I don't just put a little bit in the nasolabial groove. I'm going to build out the face with several syringes because I don't think you'll see enough difference. You don't get to blink with one syringe. Now, if they just do one or two syringes or they've had a couple syringes, that's not a big deal. But I'm talking about someone that adequately builds volume to the face. I have trepidation going and building a permanent filler that, as I said, is the mattress. It's less accurate, and I don't go subcutaneous and try to do that. Or you get complications around the eye, as Mike was talking about. It's a foundation work for the face. So how about fat on top of fat? I used to do a lot of this, but again, fat is not going to be that accurate when you're trying to make perfect corrections of the face. So I advocate multi-session uh, fat transfers may be exhausting, as Mike was suggesting. I completely concur. It's exhausting for the surgeon. It's exhausting for the patient. So we need the communication on the front end. If we're doing temporary fillers on top of fat, I love it. It's fantastic. If you want to just do a little bit, and that's what patients come back every year to two years with a little bit of aging, a little bit of treatment here, I'll come back and do a little bit. I like to give that time for that fat to mature, and I really believe like a hair transplant, it takes a little while for that fat to build up and mature, so don't get um, overzealous and try to stick more fat, more fillers in someone two to three months out because you're going to go through a period of time when that fat crenates a little bit and hasn't taken that neovascularization process, which is a subject for another talk, and builds over a period of uh, uh, nine months to a year. And if you really follow that result, you want to be careful not to overfill someone. If they're really wanting something more quickly, the temporary filler is a great way to go because you can always reverse it down a little bit. Permanent fillers on fat is probably my 
absolute favorite. This is the, the combo that I, I love because people that pay for a permanent uh, volumization of the face, they want something durable and permanent to brush up and touch up that fat. And for me, PMMA done very carefully in the right places allows me to blend it out. So if uh, fat on top of permanent fill, I don't like. I mean, unless they just did one or two syringes, again, for all the concepts that were communicated in terms of the face like a bed. So I like fat as a great foundation, and I always tell my patients down the road, a little bit of a filler touch-up is going to be important to maintain, sustain, improve, uh, and finesse that result. So those three tools I hope you can uh, leverage, you can uh, use in your practice, and if they don't make sense, then that's fine. You just distill what will work for you and what won't. So this is a lady that uh, I showed in my PMA talk. This is a combination of just fillers. So she's had about 20 syringes. And if you look at her lips on the left, they don't match. They don't balance. They look off and they're badly designed. But once you integrate the face, do a little bit of correction in the lower lip, the face blends in and it makes it look softer, more attractive. And really, this blink concept is about shaping all these little nuances. And in a 35-year-old that doesn't want necessarily fat, fillers I can do uh, really good work with. Or if someone over a period of seven years, and it, the, all this is the same lighting, same camera. I'm very rigorous when I shoot these photography. I know that the, the hair is better. But this is makeup to makeup. And what I want you to see is that that blink effect, this is 35 on the left and 42 on the right. This is an evolution over seven years' time the person has better light reflex. You heard Mark talk about this. And this is about shaping all these other areas. And so one area I've been highly cautious with, both with fat and with fillers, is the anterior cheek. And the reason is that picture those cheeks on the right sitting on the face on the left. It's just like those lips. They look weird. And so when I have patients that have, have over-injected anterior cheeks or weird areas, sometimes if you can't reduce it, you can blend out the outer face. And the one thing I've been doing with fat and fillers is doing a heck of a lot less filler in the anterior cheek for two reasons. One, in a static state it looks weird sometimes. In addition, the thing you don't see is that when people smile, that dynamic movement of the fat up toward the, the face looks weird, whereas you're not going to have that compromise on the outer shell of the face. And I'm really, really focused on ovalizing the outer shape, the shape of the face. And I believe that that finesse work is, is so much more powerful with fillers. But when I do fat, I can shape it in a way that I blend much more into the outer face. So I'm putting about two to three cc's, up to four cc's in the outer cheek coming down with fat. And now I'm getting down to less than one cc in the anterior cheek. Because I really believe it's, that's the area where you can fail and have a face look off. Especially when I'm seeing my patients five, six years down the road, I'm watching that change over that period of time. It's really important to work more on the lateral face. That's one of my take home lessons here. So if you look at this lady here, if you use your scientific left brain, you'll say, I don't think she looks that much better then I would, I would concur with you. But if you use the blink effect and just looking at her face, I think she looks softer. Then if you come back and just tell her, I'm gonna finesse it with a little bit of filler around the eyes and the, and the, and the, the mouth, it's not perfect. This is, you still see a little tear trough, but it improves that blink a little bit. And you take that two-step leap, the 80-20 rule, you get someone looking a little bit better in a softer way. And also these people have had neuromodulators over the period of time. There's a lady, a little bit more eye makeup on the right, I apologize. Uh, but if you look at this, this is, if you use that left analytical brain, you'll say, oh, I don't see much difference. But if you use the right brain, the, the, looking at the person and just shaking their hand, you're going to say she looks better. And if I come back and I finesse it with a couple syringes, whatever you like, PMMA, uh, HAs, uh, calcium hydroxyapate, whatever is your flavor, this is just to finesse it. And it takes that blink up, that 20%, and it may hit that tipping point where they look better. And this is from beginning to end. So, a little plug for the book, and I just always want to encourage uh, all of you as an audience member is to think less rigorously scientifically for a moment when you communicate and look at a patient and use that artistic right brain to achieve excellent results. I would like um, my two uh, panelists for the remaining few minutes here to go. Any questions for any of us, by the way?